Hi, I'm Dr. Sally Rush Wagner, the executive director and founder of the Matilda Jocelyn Gage Foundation. The foundation runs the Matilda Jocelyn Gage home, which we've turned into a center for social justice dialogue. Early on, 20 years ago, this is actually our 20th anniversary, we thought when we purchased the house and turned it into a, a museum, we thought, do we really want to do the typical uh, hot historic home museum? Here's where she slept, and here's where they ate, and here's how they went to the bathroom, and you know, the sorts of things you get in any historic home. Well, Matilda was our model, and she said when a biographer asked her for a sketch of her life, she said, that she was insulted when people ask her about her husband and her children and her family life. She said, this is my work. And so this house continues the work for social justice of Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and it is then a center for social justice dialogue. Each of the rooms carries one of her social justice issues, as you'll see when we go through. Uh, when you enter the house, you have a couple rules. Check your dogma at the door and think for yourself. She said the most important lesson of her life was the one that she got from her father, which was to think for herself. So when she went up against the church fathers when she was, I think, about 14, her dad had her back. Uh, she was a thinker. She said, you need to question every bit of authority. So we carry on that rule in the house. And we decided, you know, if she was a rule breaker, we should probably create a place where people can break all the rules. So we invite you to break all the rules of historical museums. We invite you to uh, sit on the furniture, to touch all the artifacts, to eat and drink, to, um, you know, just interact with everything. And most of all, the rule that you have to break is you have to write on the walls. We decided that was the biggest rule of museums. You could never write on the wall. You write on the wall at the Gage Center. So I want to just show you a few of the highlights. You have a lot of items to buy here. Invite you to go on our uh, website, matildajocelyngage.org, and in the gift shop you'll see these items. But Two places I want to point out to you here. One is our equal pay table. <laughs> All items on this table are a dollar for men, and it used to be 79 cents for women, but now it's 89 cents. And you see here, KH. This was when Kathy Hochul, the Lieutenant Governor of New York, came to visit the home, and she said, well, maybe 79 nationally, but in New York State, it's 89. So I said, you know, Matilda would have welcomed graffiti. And I would love it if the Lieutenant Governor would graffiti our signage here. And so she marked out 79 foot 89 in New York State. And then she identified herself, KH. Um, you know, the point is, this is the way we need to understand the history. It isn't what happened then, it what keeps going on. And here we have Matilda Jocelyn Gage with a quote that uh, says, and I'm going to read it for you as you read it. Man, in thrusting the enforcement of his curse upon woman in Christian lands, has made her the great unpaid laborer of the world. In European countries and in the United States, we find her everywhere receiving less pay than man for the same kind and quality of work. You see in this the great unpaid laborer of the world and equal pay for equal work, which was an issue that Gage and the women's movement had as early as the 1850s when women made only half the wages, a third to a half of the wages that men made. And today it's like, hmm, 79%. At this rate, it's what, 150 years before we get pay equity? We gotta speed it up. This is our Oz corner, and it's in the process of being, as is the whole house, revised because obviously with COVID, we can't do touch everything, 
you know, eat and drink, do all of that. We have to really redo the, uh, the house. But um, if you're interested in any of these items, please let us know. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next room that we're coming to is actually the last room that people visit in the house. It's the Religious Freedom Room. And it is where you learn. After you've gone through the whole, this was an amazing woman, how come I don't know about her? Well, the reason is because she got written out of history. Um, when Susan B. Anthony wanted to bring everybody together, all the suffragists working for women's rights of all kinds together, and she affected a merger between the conservative group and the more progressive group, and it ended up really turning into a case where it brought in religious fundamentalists like the Women's Christian Temperance Union, who wanted to put God in the Constitution and prayer in the public schools and put Jesus Christ as the head of the government and encroach the religious conservative ideas into uh, government and um, Gage said, you know what, it's not going to matter who votes if we lose religious freedom in this country. So we invite people to cast their ballot. Do you want to maintain the separation of church and state or create a Christian nation? And here is your ballot and you fill it out and you drop it into the ballot box. This we're going to have to put away because we had to do it during COVID. But we invite people to dialogue about the separation of church and state. We give them background information, dialogue questions, information, um, how the Supreme Court just dangerously undermined the separation of church and state. So the idea in the Gage Center is then and now. This is what she was dealing with during her time. This is what we're dealing with now. But the first real room in the Gage Tour, we invite people to enter at any point they want, but if you're getting kind of a, a coherent tour and they're all self-guided, you begin in the Haudenosaunee room, which is the next room that we'll be going into. This is where you learn how Matilda Jocelyn Gage got her idea of what would a transformed world be. Not just equality, but what would it look like to have a world of harmony and balance uh, where there was an equal uh, responsibility of duties. And she saw it in her nearest neighbors, the Haudenosaunee. She said, never was justice more perfect, never was civilization higher. And we also don't want to start with the typical settler colonial history, which is history begins when white people enter the land. No, you are in the aboriginal territory of the Onondaga Nation. It's one of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The biggest message in this room is that women of all six of the Haudenosaunee traditional nations, women have had political voice for over a thousand years, since at least the founding of the Confederacy, a thousand years of political voice, while in 2020, we are celebrating a hundred years of United States women gaining the right to vote uh, nationally with the 19th Amendment. The first draft of the Constitution, <laughs> the, uh, the wampum belt that signifies the five nations originally of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy, that was the model for democracy. Well, it was also the model for women's rights. When women had no right to their property, to their belongings, to their bodies, to their children. Husbands could will away an unborn child in the state of New York. Um, when women had absolutely no legal identity, once they married, they were considered dead in the law. At that time, in the 18, middle of the 19th, uh, 19th century, the 1850s, um, they, they knew women, Gage, Stanton, Lucretia Mott, they knew and, and in some cases spent time with women who had 
all of those rights and that authority over their own lives. Um, who invite people to, to try on the traditional 19th century costumes with the uh, corset and all the layers of, of petticoats and uh, and you know tightly combined or binding their feet, binding their their waists, and uh, then to try on the traditional Haudenosaunee clothing, which really became the model for the dress reform movement. So we leave the Haudenosaunee. Oh, I should point out we have an absolutely unique collection here. It's a new art form, Rofenes, and it's created by a Tuscarora Haudenosaunee traditional beadwork artist, and she wanted to combine her artwork with uh, her friend who is a white, a non-native quilter. And so they put together this form of art to commemorate and celebrate Gage's friendship with Haudenosaunee women. Um, one of the things that, that uh, Rosie Hill, who is the Tuscarora beadwork artist, and this is the traditional artwork that they did, and the form, it's called whimsies. And in the 19th century, every home, including Matilda Jocelyn Gage's, in this area at least, and anybody who traveled to Niagara Falls, would have purchased some kind of whimsy, a purse, a pincushion, uh, a hat, a wall hanging, a frame for pictures. Uh, they were really in all the, uh, the non-native uh, homes where people had visited Niagara Falls or at some other point uh, purchased. And this is the raised beadwork that is uh, representative of the Tuscarora Nation. And they live closest to, their, their nation is closest to uh, Niagara Falls. So, <laughs> Rosie's ancestors, the picture of them over here, they sold whimsies at Niagara Falls. And then next to it, we have a visit to Niagara Falls that Matilda Jocelyn Gage made in 1852. And Rosie and I, the Tuscarora beadwork artist, Rosie and I laughed to think, maybe Matilda Jocelyn Gage met Rosie's ancestors and bought a whimsy from them. But uh, this art form, it, actually these are museum pieces and they shouldn't be here, they should be in, in you know, art museums, Rosie's work is in the Smithsonian, it's in London, uh, it's all over the world. Um, and if anybody is interested in purchasing any of these incredible art forms, unique. We had a beadwork artist, um, Authority, come and do a lecture for us, and she said, this is the creation of a new art form. And it means so much to us that it was created at Rosie's insistence, it was her idea, uh, to celebrate Gage's friendship with Haudenosaunee women. In 1893, she supported treaty rights and sovereignty. She wrote about the superior position of Haudenosaunee women, not superior to men in their own culture, but superior to women in the U.S. nation. And uh, she did that when she was president of the National Woman Suffrage Association in 18... Um, when was that? Would have been 1875. A whole series of front page articles in the New York Evening Post. Um, so she supported Native, um, their major positions need to have their sovereignty recognized. She said they're, they're independent nations every bit as much as Canada and Mexico. And when New York State was considering legislation to give voting rights to Native men, and the chiefs at Onondaga said, absolutely not, We're, we are citizens of our own nations. We're not citizens of New York. And Gage wrote in her woman suffrage newspaper, which was the official newspaper of the National Woman Suffrage Association, she wrote an editorial in support 
of the chief's decision. And she said, is that the greatest hypocrisy? That the government is trying to force citizenship on Indian men, the better to steal their lands, while it's denying it to its own women citizens. So this is the story of the influence of the Haudenosaunee on the women's rights movement. The clan mothers continued to nominate, hold in office, and remove, if necessary, the chiefs. In 1893, Gage is given an honorary adoption into the Wolf Clan of the Mohawk Nation. She is given a real name, Kawanahawi, that is still used today, and she is considered, she writes to her daughter Helen, considered for a voice in the Council of Matrons, which would give her a political voice in her adopted nation. The same year, she's arrested for voting for school commissioner in New York State. And it's a test case, she loses it. But that irony, you know, here is a nation in which even adopted citizens may have a political voice. At the same time, the United States women arrested for voting. Um, women having absolute control of their own bodies among the Haudenosaunee and of all their belongings. So we'll move now into the Underground Railroad room. And you can go through the house in any order, but we're gonna come back to the two major bomb rooms in a bit. But we're heading now to the Underground Railroad room. And I think what I'm gonna do first is to stand at the doorway of civil disobedience. <laughs> because this doorway represents the two major rooms in the house, the Underground Railroad Room and the Women's Rights Room, which we'll go to in a minute. They're the two major rooms because these were really her two major issues. Gage offers this home as a station on the Underground Railroad after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act. It meant she was subject to six months in prison, in jail, and a $1,000 fine for each freedom taker that she helped on the way to freedom and gave sanctuary to. And she said, and I may read over here, that it was the proudest moment of her life when I look back upon most satisfaction is that when Mr. Reverend, Mr. Logan, that's Jermaine Logan, who is the Syracuse conductor of the Underground Railroad, went to the village of my residence to ascertain the names of those upon whom runaway slaves might depend for aid and comfort on the way to Canada. I was one of the two solitary persons who gave him their names. Myself and one gentleman of Fayetteville were the only two persons who dared thus publicly, and she wrote, uh, she signed a petition saying she would, she would disobey the Fugitive Slave Act, dared thus publicly defy the law of the land, and for humanity's sake, rendered ourselves liable to fine and imprisonment in the county jail for the crime of feeding the hungry, giving shelter to the oppressed, and helping the black slaves on to freedom. The African-American consultants in this room gave us these sh uh, uh, shackles to let people get a feeling for what it felt to be enslaved. Children are invited to lie down here as tight as sardines in a pan to feel what it was on the middle passage in a picture behind us here. These are, of course, things that we're gonna have to put on postponement until after COVID is done. But the way in which people were just packed like, like sardines in uh, the passage from Africa to the US. We mention here the language that is really important. Outdated language is freedom, see freedom seeker, fugitive slave, slave, illegal alien. We use the language of freedom taker 
Uh, Vanessa Johnson, who is a consultant in this room, said, look, these people didn't seek their freedom, they took it. And so we've introduced to the world the concept of freedom taker as the strongest term. They were not slaves. That was not their whole condition. They were enslaved people, which meant they could be free of enslavement. And we bring it to today to say, look, illegal alien is an incorrect term. Think about the implications of that term. We, these are undocumented workers. And then we come to probably one of the most important parts of this house. Um, where did they stay? We don't know for sure, but we do know that one of the places they stay, uh, the freedom takers, was hidden in plain sight. So there might have been in this house, as there was in other houses, an ordinary bookshelf, but behind it, there was a tiny space where an enslaved person could hide. You see inside? We invite students to come into this space. We provide them with a pencil and a flashlight, a little tiny light, and a, a little book to write down their thoughts when they're in this place, knowing that if they say a word, if they sneeze, it could be discovered and they could be taken back into enslavement. Um, what else in this room? Oh, <laughs> Gage wrote in 1893 her major work, Woman, Church, and State. She exposed not only sexual abuse by Catholic priests and Protestant ministers, but also she exposed the practice of, uh, of um, enslavement that continued, uh, where women were taken as basically sex slaves in the United States. So the idea is that even though everywhere on the earth enslavement is illegal, there are more enslaved people today than there have ever been in the history of the world. And Gage wrote about that in 1893. So we talk about how trafficking, human trafficking, is the modern form of enslavement. And so the fight to end slavery didn't end with the 13th Amendment. It continues today. I wanna bring you into this area where you're gonna find some really nice pictures of uh, that are going to introduce us into Baum's time in the Gage home. These are photos. In 1887, um, Maud and Frank, and you're Ozzy, so you know all this stuff. You know that Frank and Maud married, that Maud was Matilda's youngest daughter. They courted in this house. They were married in this house. And this is the only home open to the public where Frank and Maude lived. Um, the photos are ones that he took that summer of 1887. He was on the road back and forth, but Maude and the boys lived here. And uh, he took these photos with a new camera that he'd gotten. It had just come out, and uh, so he was photographing. It is so rare to have photos inside and out of a 19th century home that you're restoring. But we use these photos to restore the home to what it looked like. It had been changed, especially this side of the house, uh, the top picture had been changed. Uh, this one is fun because this is Maud and Frank Jocelyn on the front porch of the house in the summer of 1887. And of course, kids see this picture and they figure that's a little girl. And then we explain to them that gendered clothing is not, you know, a universal and who wears dresses, what boys and men wear dresses. And, you know, boys wore dresses and had long hair until they were about five years old. And so uh, we do a little gender, uh, um, study with the, uh, the dress that Frank Jocelyn is wearing. 
And now we are going to go into the women's rights parlor. Oh, this final picture down here is one that Frank took of, and these are, of course, enlargements, but this is one that Frank took of uh, Genesee Street that runs in front of the Gage House. And he's looking down Genesee Street toward Henry's General Store, which is down at the bottom of uh, Genesee Street, the village of Fayetteville. So here actually is the only known, we might as well pause here a minute, this is the only known painting of Henry Hill Gage. Uh, this was in the home of a descendant and he uh, gifted us with this. Harry Gage Carpenter, whose father was actually born in this house uh, upstairs. Um, we're moving now into the women's rights room and when you come to visit after the pandemic, this is what will happen. We'll sit down at this table and I will offer you tea and cookies. And so we're gonna virtually have a little bit of tea in a women's suffrage cup today. But um, the most important thing in this room really, there's a lot, but I'm just gonna jump to uh, her desk. That's the most valuable um, item in the house. And that item in most, this is her actual desk. It was gifted to me by Matilda Jewell Gage, who is how I got into this whole business. <laughs> she was a friend of my mom's in Aberdeen, South Dakota. And I knew nothing about Matilda Jocelyn Gage growing up, or really about L. Frank Baum. My mother had an interest, but I really wasn't interested. Uh, and a friend of mine, when I was teaching women's studies, early, I, 1970 was my first class, and a friend of mine, a colleague, was doing research on the women's suffrage campaign in 1890 in South Dakota, and she came across the name Matilda Gage. She had some connection to my hometown of Aberdeen. Had I ever heard of Gage? Well, I, I have some vague memory that there was a Matilda Gage that was a friend of my mom's, and I called my mom up, and she knew all about it. She said, yeah, oh, Matilda and I did a skit for the Dakota Territorial Pioneers, and Matilda portrayed her grandmother, and I portrayed uh, Susan B. Anthony. And so she told me all about Matilda Jocelyn Gage, how important she was, equally important with Stanton and Anthony uh, in the women's suffrage movement, the National Women's Suffrage Association. And, and why hadn't she told me any of this? And my mom kind of paused for a minute and she said, hmm, I guess she never asked. So the moral of the story is ask. Um, anyway, uh, when I moved here in 1999 to save this house from destruction because it was rental property, it had deferred maintenance all over it, and uh, you know the unpainted wood indicated that it wasn't going to last long. So I formed the Gage Foundation. We purchased the house. We actually, this is our, our, our anniversary upon anniversary. It's 20 year anniversary in 2020 of the, um, the incorporation of the Gage Foundation, our 10 year history of opening. And some of you wonderful Aussies were here for that opening and remember it. Um, you also were here the year before when you came into the house wearing uh, hard hats as we were in the middle of construction when we hosted the International Wizard of Oz Club. When the pandemic is over, we would love to host it again. Once we really can, can bring you in here to do what, uh, what's worth doing. But anyway, we invite, instead of having the most important artifact in the house, you know, uh, sort of behind some kind of uh, curtain or something that would allow you not to get close to it. Uh, we invite people to sit down at Gage's desk and leave her a note. And uh, we do that because I own the desk and that's what I want to have happen to that desk. 
I want it to be open to people. We also want people to dialogue, like Matilda said, think for yourself. There's challenging ideas in this house. You know, the challenge to religion, the challenge to uh, enslavement continuing, the, the need to support native rights and sovereignty. And so we have here a basket of gauge, and it's just filled with quotes from Matilda. We invite people to pull one of these quotes and just read it. The law of motherhood, for example, here's one. The law of motherhood should be entirely under woman's control, but in order to be that, woman must first of all be held as having a right to herself. And then we invite people to think about that. You know, still controversial issue today. But the story I want to tell you about this room, the Oz story, is this. There were, instead of these doors that we currently have, it was a pocket door, and the back parlor was where Gage carried out the work of the women's suffrage movement from 1869 to 1889, when the women's movement actually was dissolved, it became a suffrage movement, vote only, brought in Christian conservatives, Gage drops out. But in 18... 82, when Maud is at Cornell, Frank is coming here to visit. And they are courting in the front parlor, which is the formal part of the house. And the pocket doors have the uh, closure between the two rooms. So Gage is back here. We know there was a table here. We know that this is where she was working on the history of women's suffrage probably at that very time, and working as the um, executive, the chair of the executive committee of the National Women's Suffrage Association. So envision this table piled with all kinds of, we know when Anthony was here and, and uh, working together on the history of women's suffrage, there were all kinds of boxes around where Gage had collected, and she did a huge collection, which is now in the Library of Congress, of the uh, newspaper clippings from the women's movement, what their activities were, their conventions, all of that, and their activism. So piled high, book boxes all around, lots of stuff on the table. She's busy at work and she does not want to be interrupted. And Frank and Maude are courting in the, in the front parlor and she's paying no attention. Boom, the doors open. Maud comes in and interrupts her mother. Uh, Frank and I are getting married. Matilda is furious. Her daughter is at Cornell. Matilda has been part of opening Cornell University to women. And Maud is not the first year, but she's one of the first. She's forging the way. And then Maud's dream is she's going to go on to law school when she finishes at Cornell. And she's going to become the lawyer that her mother never was able to be. Susan B. Anthony said about Matilda Jocelyn Gage, she had the best sense of law of anybody she knew. She was brilliant. When Minor versus Haverstadt happened, uh, the Supreme Court said in 18... Uh, 75 women did not have the right to vote in the United States of America. And Gage tore that argument apart in a most sophisticated legal argument proving the U.S. did have voters and could enforce women's voting. Um, so here, here Maud comes in, interrupts her mother who's working, and tells her that she is dropping all of her dreams, all of her plans, to marry some guy who will never be able to support her. And at that time, women, once they married, middle-class women, did not go to work. There was no means of employment for them. So she's going to have to depend on this itinerant actor who has no, no prospects at all. And Gage just blows up Jocelyn Temper, blows up and says, no daughter of mine will marry an itinerant actor. And then Maud goes toe to toe with her mom and says, well then we'll elope. 
Frank's in the parlor. He's listening to all this. Those doors, we've closed the doors and we've carried on this conversation. And you hear it very clearly in there and he is right next to the front door. He could have slunk out and never been seen again. Instead, he stayed. And the next thing you heard was laughter. Outrageous laughter on the part of these two women because Matilda looks at Maud and she sees this seed that she planted, this daughter who she taught from the time she knew how to speak or think, to think for herself, to make her own decisions. And she realized, this is what I trained, this is what I wanted, this is what I got. Of course you're going to get married. And yes, of course you'll be married in the house. And yes, of course I'll give you the wedding even though I'm strapped to the bones trying to keep up with my women's rights work. You will be married in this house. And they were married in the front parlor. And we're going to go now into the front parlor. But first I'm going to pour myself a cup of tea in honor of when you come to visit and you will pick up your teacup and you will have a cup of tea Okay, onward to the, what we call the family parlor, the Oz room. And you Aussies know that this is not just about, I'm going to turn the lights on so we can see full here. I think, well, I'm just going to jump to this because this is what is really fun here. This is the photo that Frank took of this parlor during his stay here in 1887. And you see the details. You see the Lambertons. You see the, uh, the mirror. You see the owl. You see the chairs. You see the pictures on the wall. Now, I want to back up and show you. This is the only part of the house that we created to look as it did in 1887. And if you stand where I'm standing and you turn around, I want you to see what you see. You see the chandelier, a replica, but very close. You see the hanging, it's a, a horn, powder horn, from, and this is a replica, from the Revolutionary War, Matilda Jocelyn Gage's grandfather, Hezekiah Jocelyn, was in the Revolutionary War, and he brought this back from it. Um, you see the owl, you see the table, you see the two chairs, those are the actual chairs. And they were gifted to us by a descendant of Matilda Jocelyn Gage. There's a mirror, the Lambertons, and in the corner, you see a painting. And that painting of apple blossoms, a watercolor, was done by Matilda Jocelyn Gage. The, the um, painting below it is actually a, a copy of the same painting that was in the Gage parlor. And the fabric that's hanging from it is the same fabric that was hanging actually probably in the parlor because it's a piece of Magdalena Towers Watson's wedding dress, Matilda Jocelyn Gage's great-grandmother. Um, and the photo is a photo that Frank took of Matilda painting. And if you look at the apple blossom watercolor and you look at the one of the apple blossom that's hanging in the photo, it is not exactly the same picture, but it gives us the idea that probably she was doing a series of, uh, she had an apple tree in the backyard. Here's what probably happened. She had an apple tree. Probably in a wind, this heavy branch broke and it was heavy because look at all the apples on it. So she probably brought it inside painted it, and then made applesauce, as we know she served in the house, made applesauce out of the apples. 
That's the story of Matilda Jocelyn Gage. Now, if she'd sold it as a fundraiser for the women's rights movement, that would have been the full story. She probably just gave it to people in the house. The painting next to it, the watercolor, is this one is also done by Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and it's uh, it's a, a lake, one of the Finger Lakes. It's a, a drawing that she did of it. She was a gifted artist. I mean, this stuff is not. It's not bad. Now, you see here a whole play corner because down here we wanted kids to be able to, uh, to enjoy. And uh, so there's dress up uh, shoes and ruby red slippers, dolls to play with. There's, uh, you can dress up like Dorothy, take pictures of yourself. There's just lots of stuff. And then there's a whole reading corner, which was made possible, I will say, by Mac and John Donaldson, who wanted to do this in honor of their mother, Janet Donaldson. And then that picture that we were given recently, if we could take a close-up of this, for the Gage House from Vincent, I can't remember his last name, uh, Vince, I can't remember his last name, but with love. And the artist gave us this picture to hang here, which is wonderful. And then we have, okay, we'll do a, a little commercial here. The Wonderful Mother of Oz, which is a little uh, booklet that I wrote about how Matilda influenced Frank. I'm going to tell you um, a couple of stories about that. I, again, um, we have a piano. It's not the piano that was in the house. Uh, but we know that there was the uh, Leslie piano that uh, one of the descendants today has. Uh, so we have this, and we invite people to play, and we have a song, Battle Hymn of the Suffragists, that was written for Matilda Jocelyn Gage. We invite people to play that and do a sing-along, as well as I'm, was, I'm Abolitionist and Glory in the Name, the William Lloyd Garrison abolition song that Gage said that she sang when she was at an abolition rally in Syracuse when she was a child. She circulated anti-slavery petitions when she was a child. She said, I was born with a hatred of, of oppression and a love of liberty. So, what do we have in this parlor that tells us about the social justice work of L. Frank Baum. Well, a couple things that we talk about. One is <laughs> second book, The Land of Oz. And you all know this book, you know, the, the one where Tip discovers at the end that he is actually a female trapped in a male's body, that he's been um, bewitched by the evil witch Mombi. And if he, she is to be her authentic self, she must undergo a gender transformation. And she is, he, Tip, is reluctant and says, uh, ooh, I'm not sure I want to be a girl. And the cowardly lion, the, the characters, the Tin Woodman, the cowardly lion, and the scarecrow, become a support group and they say, you know what, we will love you just the same as when you're a girl. And in fact, one of them says, you know, girls may be better than boys. And so at the end, Tip undergoes the transformation and becomes Ozma, the rightful ruler of Oz. I think the connection with Gage is that when she writes in her major work, Woman, Church, and State, about the matriarchate, She's talking about an egalitarian, peaceful society. She's talking about traditional indigenous societies, then and now, where, where women, because they are the potential creators of life, are held especially sacred. And in, in indigenous communities, two spirits are given a very sacred position. And did Frank know that? I don't know. But through Gage, he very easily could have. They, Gage closed up this house every year 
after Henry, her husband's death, in 1884, she closed up this house and for the last, um, what was it, 12, she was 84, she died in 19, or in 1898, last 14 years of her life, she spends with the bombs wherever they're living. They're living in Syracuse first, then Aberdeen, then Chicago, and she's with them the whole time, spending the entire winter. Now, you've got to get along with your mother-in-law if you're going to spend that much time with her. And in fact, it looks like they developed a really loving relationship. You know, she writes at one point in one of her letters, Frank just came in and, and kissed me goodbye as he was heading out. Um, they, they share the same books, the same ideas, they're reading the same things. You can only imagine the conversations around the table. I think about uh, Gage being a vegetarian and how Frank loved his breakfast meat. Maud was always, Matilda Jewel Gage told me, Maud was always at great uh, pressure to figure out a new um, breakfast meat for Frank to have in the morning. And, uh, and <laughs> so we have what? We have the hungry tiger who longs to eat fat babies but, but doesn't feel like he can because it's morally wrong. We have uh, Belina when he, uh, Belina the hen and Dorothy are, are trapped uh, you know, on an island and Dorothy can find nothing to eat and the, Belina is just peck, peck, pecking away. And, uh, and Dor Dor uh, Belina says there's lots to eat. And Dorothy says, oh, there's nothing to eat but bugs and, and worms and, and uh, I can't eat that. And Belina says, but you eat the chicken that eats the worms and the bugs. You know, it's like, what should you eat? What is it morally appropriate to eat? Where does this come from? Well, does it come from the conversations with Gage? The, the, um, oh, the um, memory, memory issue. Here's a, a forgetting a name. The Gnome King who made out of stone, he is the ultimate symbol of patriarchy. He has no emotion but anger and, and he's a despot. He's, um, uh, you know, he is the ultimate patriarch uh, of power from the top down, of, of uh, violence, of anger, control by, by violence. And um, he's afraid of one thing, eggs. Why would this patriarchal symbol be afraid of eggs? Well, Gage is writing Woman, Church, and State the same time she's living with Frank and Maud, and she writes about the egg as the symbol of matriarchy, as the symbol of female power. Dorothy, the two-spirit, is ruling Oz. The gnome king who represents patriarchy is terrified of the female symbol of the matriarchy. Whew. Is this really all going on? Well, you know, Frank becomes the secretary of the Aberdeen Equal Rights Society. I discovered that going through the Aberdeen Saturday Pioneer, and I'm really glad that other authors have since picked up on my research in this area. But um, <laughs> I'm reading through the Saturday Pioneer, and I find the name of my maternal grandmother who died giving birth to my mother. And Bessie Wiley, joins the Aberdeen Equal Rights Society in the summer of 1890 after a speech by Susan B. Anthony in the, um, the Grain Palace in Aberdeen. And it's dutifully recorded by the secretary of the Equal Rights um, Association, which is L. Frank Baum. That fall, L. Frank Baum and my maternal grandmother, Bessie Wiley, star in an operetta, The Little Tycoon. Uh, it's a fundraiser to get a new organ for the Episcopal Church. And Frank plays Rufus Reddy and my grandmother plays Dolly Do-Right. And Frank writes, she wins the heart of every young man. 
I knew nothing about this. My mother knew nothing about this. She was adopted by her aunt and didn't know about her mother. So the trip to Oz, the journey to Oz for me has empowered me to know more about my own history and it's empowered my mother to know about hers. Uh, Frank was, Frank and Maud were friends with my grandmother, Bessie Wiley. So that's my personal connection. Um, I think we also have the hard story of the 1890 editorials that Frank wrote in the Aberdeen Saturday Pioneer where he called for the extermination of the Sioux Nation in two editorials at the time of the massacre at Wounded Knee. First of all, the murder of Sitting Bull and then the massacre at Wounded Knee. And um, the editorials, it took me years to recognize. I, said, I thought they were boilerplate. When I did research on it, I found that all the newspapers in that area had done similar editorials calling for genocide, calling for the extermination of the entire Sioux Nation. But that's Frank's own words. And I think um, the part I feel good about with the Gage Center and the Gage Foundation telling that story is that, you know, it's a moment, especially right now, where we need to look at the flaws of our history. And we need to take those that we revere and recognize that they were not perfect and neither are we. I consider myself a recovering racist. So when I look at Frank's editorials, I'm not pointing a finger saying, I'm perfect, you weren't. I'm looking at that saying, you know, you represent to me, L. Frank Baum, the best of who we are in this country and you also represent what's worst about us. And I think to recognize that about Baum is, uh, it's a critical moment of, of coming to terms with our past. I love this man. I mean, I've spent hours listening to stories that Matilda Jewel Gage told about her uncle Frank, and she adored him. And I carry that memory that she gave me of, what a good man he was, what a loyal, and, and you know, he, he went off on trips all the time. She said there were women that were after him all the time, but he was absolutely faithful to Aunt Maud. And she knew that, she knew that in her heart. I mean, this was a really, really good man. He was also flawed. In uh, 2006, two descendants of L. Frank Baum uh, came to the South Dakota to do an apology to the Wounded Knee Survivors Association for the editorials that Frank had written. Um, I worked with a friend of mine, uh, Vic Reynolds, he's since passed, and Vic was, a, was related to Jim Highhawk, who it was his uncle. And Jim Highhawk watched his mother and his baby brother killed by the military uh, at that attack that the army did at Wounded Knee Creek um, in the winter in December of 1890. Uh, the soldiers tracked down women who were fleeing, tracked them down five miles away. I found an account where a soldier tracked down a Lakota woman and murdered her, killed her. Um, it, was, it was an atrocity. The government has never apologized. They did deep regrets. That's what you send when you can't make it to a wedding. That's not what you do to apologize for a massacre. A, a documented massacre. The documentation of it is absolute. And the there were 30 medals of war awarded for the soldiers at Wounded Knee. And that's the largest number of medals that have ever been awarded for a peacetime activity. They have never been rescinded. Other medals have been rescinded. The Wounded Knee medals for these mass murders have not been rescinded. 
So it's still, it, it remains a pain with the Lakota people, the Sioux, as white people have called them. So, 2006, Gita Morena and Mac Hudson met with, we'd set up, Vic and I had set up meetings with the Wounded Knee descendants at uh, Pine Ridge and uh, Cheyenne River. And there was a moment when the Lakota told stories about the, the relatives they never will have because of the massacre. They told stories of what their relatives who had survived and been there or heard the stories of their survivors told of what happened at the massacre at Wounded Knee. And Gita and Mac listened. And then there was a, an apology that they issued. And then all of the descendants of one of the chiefs that was killed there went by Mac and Gita and each one of them greeted Mac and Gita and thanked them for that apology. It helped with the healing. And I remember the moment when Leonard Littlefinger, who was a descendant of Bigfoot, that was his, grand, his grandfather's brother and in the Lakota way that made him Bigfoot Leonard's grandfather, you know, that the grandfather is the grandfather of all of the siblings. So I remember Leonard took Mac's hand at the end of the ceremonial apology and he said, Mac being a descendant of L. Frank Baum, Leonard being a descendant of Bigfoot, And Leonard took Mac's hand and he said, I think our grandfathers are smiling on us. <laughs>